Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alex and I am your moderator today. Um, welcome to the Latina Identity and Gaming Mental Health panel. Uh, we're super excited to be here. Some of us are a little nervous, <laughs> myself included. Um, and some of the things that we'll talk about today is our identities, um, intersectionalities, uh, mental health in relation to gaming or representation in gaming, stuff like that. Um, so we're very much looking forward to speaking with y'all. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it around for some quick introductions. Uh, Eugenia, do you want to start us off, please? Mm -hmm, and I will even unmute myself before I try and start. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Eugenio Vargas. You might know me around the internet as DM Jazzy Hands. Uh, I'm a streamer, podcaster, and tabletop role-playing game designer. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Did I miss anything I should say? Great, that's me. 
You want to pick someone to pass it to so oh, we don't like, yes. try to talk. Well, gaming. I'm going to roll a die. One, two, multiples of four. Oh, let's uh, go. Val, you're next. <laughs> sure. Okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm uh, Val or Space Valkyries. Uh, my pronouns are she and they. Uh, and I've never done a panel like this before, so I'm definitely very anxious, but excited to, to talk with folks in general. I don't know who could go next. Somebody. <laughs> <I'll have dice. laughs> that songs. Uh, there you go. Sure. Um, so my name is Adriana Fernandez, but on the internet, I am Songs of Healing. Um, I'm a Twitch streamer. I'm a board certified music therapist. Um, yeah, that's me. So I guess I pass it on along to Vic. Hello, uh, I'm Vic Trevino. I am a uh, costumer, a uh, cosplay person. Uh, I also play TTRPGs on Twitch and uh, work full-time for Xbox Gaming uh, under Jeffrey M Consulting. So I am really excited to be here. Uh, very excited to talk about video games and also tabletop games and the way that we sort of play our lives through them. Uh, and I guess I'll end this uh, little roundtable for intros. Uh, my name is Alex Bossy, but um, on the internet, I'm just called Being Bossy. It's a play on my last name. Uh, <laughs> I am a um, mental health professional. I have a uh, license in school counseling, and I'm currently uh, back in school for the second time for some reason to get my licensure um, to be a therapist. Um, real quick little disclaimer for y'all, and I will have to read this, so there's going to be bright white light on my face. Um, and then we will go ahead and begin. Uh, <clears throat> so, welcome to the Latina Identity and Gaming Mental Health panel. This is a part of the Take This Identity and Gaming Mental Health series. Now that you have met the panelists, we want to acknowledge that no group is a monolith. And while we hope that this panel is educational and affirming, we cannot cover nor represent the entire Latina and Hispanic diaspora. Sorry, a word I, I'm not familiar with. Today, we are primarily speaking to the experiences of people with Latina and Hispanic heritage in the United States. We will be holding a lot of intersections with the acknowledgement that while systematic issues are pervasive and damaging, Different people have different experiences and opinions. Please note also that nothing in this panel should be construed nor is meant to be medical advice. We are speaking of our experiences and acknowledge and knowledge that we have gained. Please speak with your trusted professionals and community to make the decisions about your wellness that make sense for you. And now I'm going to open the conversation up to our lovely panelists here with a really easy question of <laughs> what's your mental wellness journey, mental wellness slash journey been like so far? Uh, I can kick us off. Um, I think, I think we all uh, to some extent have an answer to that question that sort of is like pre 2020 and post 2020. Uh, and I think it's worth acknowledging that as we all search for our answers for this one. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of my work in the gaming space uh, really sort of ramped up after 2020 also. So I'll sort of just talk about that period of time, um, which is to say that gaming has in a lot of ways um, and a lot of uh, unexpected ways for me been a real, uh, what's the word I want to use, uh, a real blessing and a real great way to sort of uh, be social and uh, find escapism and also process everything that's happening around us uh, and has been for the last couple of years um, in a time where we are not seeing each other in person, where we're not able to meet our mental health professionals in person in many cases. Um, I, I just restarted uh, seeing a therapist about a month ago after a long hiatus and of course it's super different for me because i've never done any remote sessions let alone i've never met my therapist in person so i think all of this has been you know in the interim gaming has really been for a lot of folks um just a, a place to do um to do myriad things to try and 
get out of our heads, process what's in our heads. Um, and we'll talk about all the different ways in which I think gaming does that for each of us, but that's a place to start anyway. Yeah, um, just kind of jumping off of that, very true. Uh, the pre-2020 and post-2020 um, journey, oh boy. Uh, my my experience is kind of the same, um, especially with gaming and finding community. Uh, about seven years ago now, um, I got sober. So pre-2020, I was like coming in, you know, you kind of start from zero when you're there uh, and your mental health uh, is... A, not great but also like you know that something needs to change and you start that process uh so i really started finding community and finding people who were like-minded but also huge nerds and who like actually supported me in not only the undertaking that i was going through but also in my life decisions and i kind of refound myself that way and then in 2020 i started transitioning openly and publicly so that experience of finding community again and like finding gaming people who are able to support me while I do that and that experience finding things again is kind of like restarting anew as well. Um, so as you know, the, the algorithms and everything push us forward and there's new games coming out and there's new things coming out, there's new people and there's new communities and there's new stuff. So it's been nice for me and my journey in those hills and valleys to always kind of come back and find people around me um, to kind of jump off of and collaborate with and feel that sense of community and joy with. Uh, yeah, I'll go next because mine's not, it's adjacent in the sense of I didn't really get into the gaming sphere like until 2020. I didn't start streaming until 2020. I was just looking for a way to not be super depressed that I couldn't leave my house because I'm immunocompromised. I'm a childhood cancer survivor. So I still can't really leave my house very often. <laughs> um, and streaming and like playing any games and, and finding a community has really kind of gotten me through that. Uh, they encouraged me to go to therapy. That's really helped. Um, and I actually, they're like, hey, you might have ADHD. You want to look into that? If you, everything you're saying... So I got an ADHD diagnosis as well and learned more about like my own processes and how I think and like, oh, I'm, I'm not lazy. That was just executive dysfunction. Got it. Cool. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's very, you know, adjacent um, for sure. And I met my partner through like the Bioware fandom and just, you know, games really can impact your life for the better. Yeah, I think even like if if I were to just hone in on like 2020 itself, right? Um, I I'm a huge uh, goer to a single festival. There is one festival that I will not miss, and that is Magfest, which takes place in January. It's on the East Coast uh, every year, and Magfest was January 2020. So like, woo, we got to do it. We brought friends for the first time. It was a great time, and then March happened, um, and the same it was amazing how like the same friends that we were in like a little chat group of like oh hey like let's coordinate the hotel room let's coordinate this we ended up like just kind of absorbing into each other and being like okay so this is this is our pod now like we we would meet on zoom every weekend to play animal crossing like everyone did but we were actually meeting on zoom to play animal crossing because <laughs> like, you know it's it's what we had and it's funny because like you know before before that year like yeah, we were, we were all friends. We were all cool. But it was like the way that we kind of like became our own support system through the gaming that we were doing together is really, I think, what got us all through it, honestly. Yeah. Awesome. Go ahead. No, no, no. I didn't. I was just going <laughs> to do my thing, but go for it, please. Oh, well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think and I think this is going to be a theme throughout our conversation today, but all of us mentioned the importance of the community, the people, the social nature, the whatever, right? Which I think like is, for all of us up here, I would assume, we've sort of 
grown to understand that games are a social thing, right? That they are, there are communities out there on the internet, certain fandoms, certain uh, creative communities, things like that. But it bears saying, because I, I do still think that outside of our circles, the the stereotype of like the lonely gamer, right? The, the basement by yourself sort of thing, whether it's tabletop or video games, I, I think that does still exist. And I think in our circles, we understand that that is not a thing and fandoms are beginning to see that as as bigger uh, as gaming uh, collectives become bigger and better known in media but i do still think that's very much a thing and and what we're going to see as we talk about today is not only ha does gaming give us these social communities that we can be a part of but we can also really zoom in and specialize those communities right and find affinity groups and things like that um for example the latine community right but not to not to splat that segue all over you but but it's true right is that this is a way in which those sort of affinity communities can have a little bit of an easier time because there is that common ground to form to gather to start meeting each other and and then to to becoming a supportive community in its own right and speaking of those communities <laughs> <laughs> yeah have y'all or would you like to speak about um, your communities that you've been able to find that kind of intersect both your identity or identities um, and gaming, if that has been a possibility for you, what you would like to see more within that, anything around that realm where you wish to take it. Um. Yes, I, I think we've all also, in addition to, you know, understanding that this is a, a value, we've gotten better at finding those communities, right? Um, and so uh, things like all of the events that go on during Hispanic Heritage Month um, are a way that I've connected with a ton of Latine streamers, um, like, like Val. I'm so happy that I found you, I think, during an event. Oh, it's been, I don't want to think about how long ago now. Uh, longer than I think it should be. And yeah, I think it was two years, which really, what? The last two years uh, have been 10. It's fine. Have been 10. Yeah, it's fine, right? <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, it's been, I'll speak a little bit on, on my experience too. In the years, in the couple of years leading up to 2020, um, before I moved my, more of my professional life into gaming. Um, I was a musical theater actor and music director conductor. Um, and I spent the better part of several, the last oh, two and a half years or so before the pandemic, um, sort of bouncing back and forth between uh, being in productions of Evita and music directing productions of In the Heights, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Evita is an old Andrew Lloyd Webber show about Eva Perone. Uh, and In the Heights, it was Lin-Manuel Miranda's, not actually first, but first solo big hits <laughs> Broadway musical before Hamilton. And it's about Washington Heights, a Latina community here in New York City. Um, and so doing those shows, I really, for the first time in my life, was spending a ton of time meeting a ton of different Latina folks from all different, right, specific country backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. And really, for again, for the first time in my life, started finding out that I was interested in, in knowing more and connecting more with that part of my identity. And then 2020 happened and the pandemic happened. And I sort of felt this real physical, obvious, immediate loss of this connect. I mean, I, my family is wonderful. I want to be very clear. I am close to my family and that is, but it, but it was different. It was, it was a variety of, of Hispanic and, and Latin culture. And it was all of these things. And I, I felt that loss and have found it again in gaming, whether it's events like this one or things that are, you know, fundraising events and whatever else is going to be going on all this month, or even just occasionally searching the Latine tag on Twitch, right, and finding yeah. some some new folks. Um, I think that not only is it valuable for us, these communities that we find and the intersections and the niches that we find important generally for our mental health and our social well-being, but it has, I mean, I have continued to learn what it is for me to be Latine, to be to be a Latino, to be Mexican, to be all of these things, right? Um, and, and then we can start layering, right? You then find the queer Latine community, you find the New York Latine community, you find the whatever, right? Uh, and, and it's a chance to continue to learn and grow like we were able to when we could get together in person. 
Yeah. Oh man. Um, while you're speaking, it's so like funny the way also that sometimes I won't even be seeking. Like, there are moments, yeah, where like in the beginning of the year, my grandfather had passed away and I was like, this is the last Spanish speaking member of my family. That was an incredible loss. And I was like, I really could use some community right now. I could really use some Latino story right now that is going to make me feel more connected and it's going to help. Um, but outside of that seeking, sometimes there's just a stumble and you find yourself in a community or, or around a piece of media or around a single character from a game that is Latino or that the community has decided is Latino or you go, you know what, I think I'm sensing this is for me now. And you just take it and around you, all of a sudden you have 10 new Twitter followers and no other people who are like, no, yeah, also Mexican, also agree. And I would like to talk about this. And it's really funny the way that like, even if it's unexpected and even if it's not intentional, uh, the way that people find each other being queer Latinos or being, uh, you know, Latinos into like League of Legends who have got really into Jace, like that kind of stuff. And they just find a thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's a community there. Uh, and that has kind of been my experience, not so much sometimes seeking, but often stumbling into these tiny pockets of excited gaming fandom or excited uh, TTRPG fandom where they go, oh no, I feel represented here. And it's just a, a many moths to a lamp. Uh, that makes sense, right? <laughs> oh yeah. I leave a big pause because I don't want to start talking over someone before someone. <laughs> I see you Sorry, all. Sorry, no, I, I wasn't sure. I, anyway, but um, I will say for me, it's been interesting because I grew up um, with my, so I'm biracial Mexican American and white, and my family is very white from small town Texas, and it's not necessarily the best. Um, and I grew up with a lot of like this feeling of, you know, you you know, you're white, asterisk. And then when 2020 happened, what was interesting was that I found my way into streaming and I found my way into like the queer Latina circles. Like I met Eugenio, I met, um, I geeked out, I met Lo-Fi who's in chat. Um, I met some people who like, were like, hey, yeah, you know, this is, that's, those are microaggressions and that's actually really shitty. And like your identity is valid. And like, you know, so it was just really, it was the first time I felt that community like genuinely and it was something I really 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 needed and so it was a big deal for me <laughs> like I can't speak Spanish I was my my dad's family is very um, disjointed they never really want anything to do with me so it was very like oh you know um I, I now have that that community tie people who can tell me here's what this word means here's you know what this is and here's you know all this and, and it, it was really important so yeah that's kind of my, why community for me was such a big deal like it's kind of adjacent to that really I just need <laughs> I just need this and it's it's just, that's what was my experience with it so yeah and I've had a very similar experience too especially with being raised no sabes like being raised intentionally not speaking Spanish because my family was su very super Mexican. Uh, and my dad is white and my mom was like, no, you're going to go to Catholic school and you're going to speak English and you're going to assimilate. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, I didn't think about <laughs> it as a child. And then um, I am in high school and my entire family speaks Spanish and I understand it very well. And I can, I'm starting to pick things up and they're like, no, 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 stop. We need you to not we need you to like get into college. And I'm like, yo, this could help me. And they said, no, stop it. So I, it is very interesting sort of seeing that throughout my life and then kind of also coming to that realization, like, oh, that was a microaggression. Like that was white assimilation. Like that was a problem actually. Uh, Cause my family was like, no, we don't speak that at home anymore. Cause we don't need that. What are you talking about? So it was very revealing uh, to live that experience and sort of find um, as things shift and change, I'm changing the subject here because of ADHD. Um, it's really interesting to see like as things shift and change the way that it does feel like we're getting a little bit more uh, embrace, like more 
pieces of media that embrace like perhaps this character is Latino, perhaps they have a very heavy she like Chicano Latino accent, perhaps they have like some Spanish lines. And it is really cool to sort of see that start to eke its way back in because it feeds more community and it feeds more. I identify with this. Oh, that feels real. That feels like something I can relate to. Um, as opposed to when I was growing up where it was a lot more like, no, nope, all default white, like this is the right way to be, this is the correct sort of thing, and this is how we're going to assimilate and also pass, quote unquote, even though like they're, we'll see, we can talk about white passing later, but oh man, um, that's been my experience too, is, is really what I'm trying to say. Uh, and it's interesting to see how that has shifted and changed as time has moved on. No, I totally agree. Like, um, like when uh, if anyone was talking about In the Heights, right? So that also came out in theaters. If you haven't seen it, uh, what are you waiting for? If you haven't listened to it, what are you waiting for? I have no feelings about In the Heights. What are you talking about? Um, when I saw it in theaters, I cried a solid five times. I purposely went in blind because um, I like <laughs> I saw Hamilton and I knew every line. And I was like, you know what? Let me go into another show and not know every line this time. Oops. So I, I went in not knowing what to expect. And I cried at like the most mundane moments in the movie. And it was because for the first time in my life, I saw myself on a screen. I'm 30 some years old. For the first time in my life, I saw myself on screen. I saw people speaking Spanglish as broken as we all do or don't, you know. I saw people that, you know, ate certain foods, that talked about eating certain foods. I saw arroz con habichuelas y plátano, like, for the first time. And the fact that, like, I was able to have that experience was like, oh, my oh God. First of all, I didn't even know that that's what I was waiting for. But, hi, that's what I was waiting for. And, like knowing that that is starting to come out and like I, I think that we're really only like just barely scratching the surface of it coming out because you know there's there's definitely media where that are doing better than others I think movies are doing better I think um games still have a little bit more I think we're still kind of stuck with like there's that token one person oh there's that token other person oh <laughs> Um, I think I've definitely, and, and like, you know, there's, there's some token games, you know, like a, a shout out to Guacamelee, you know, but I'm still waiting for like more games. Um, also, um, waiting for more diversity of who it is that we're representing because, um, spoiler alert, not everyone is Mexican. Hi, I'm not Mexican. I am Puerto Rican. And, you know, when uh, Assassin's Creed 4 decided that it was Mayans that were in the Caribbean, I had many feelings because I'm going to tell you right now, they were like a thousand miles away from the Caribbean. It was actually my indigenous people, the Taino that were in the Caribbean. So yeah, like I said, I have feelings, but you know, the fact that we have come from like, okay, you tried Bronze Star to like, we can actually maybe see ourselves in things. That would be really lovely is I think it's huge. Agree. We all agree. Yeah. Please go ahead, Vic. Uh, I was just gonna say, do we all have that moment where we like saw our, ourselves or like saw a very tiny little itty bitty Spanish thing and instantly burst into tears? Because uh, mine was when Miles Morales' mom starts speaking mm. Spanish in the beginning yeah. of the Spider Verse, like no subtitles, no nothing. subtitles. She's just speaking, and I lost it. I'm thirty seconds into the film, and I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you didn't Wait, just what'd she say? <laughs> It's yeah. just started. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yes, we we uh when we kind of have talked a little bit before, we talked about that specific moment because yeah. there was no subtitles yeah. and how impactful it is when there is no subtitles because it's like an I see you, right? Yeah. Like an I see you. I know that you're going to be watching this movie and this is just for you. This is yeah. just for this community. We're not going to have subtitles. And some folks were upset about it, but you know, but overall, I hear really positive things of like, wow, I'm so happy they didn't put subtitles. Yeah. Um, which gave me, y'all have gone, I'm like, where do I want to go with this conversation? Because <laughs> we're hitting so many points that we all wanted to talk about. But let's just go ahead and go um, with representation. Let's go ahead and talk about, um, you can take positive, you can take negative, you can take both. And talk about how that can affect us um, and our mental health or, you know, 
um, in general. <laughs> so Miles Morales. I mean, I can start again, but does anyone yeah, else want to get us started? <laughs> Me just always letting you, Hideo, go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing a trend. <laughs> um, that's fine. I could, yeah. I mean, I, the physical catharsis that we all just described at that moment, like right, the crying, like I think that is an indication that it it is um, deeply felt. This representation when we when we find it, right. And what I actually want to start talking about with this uh, is something that just occurred to me as I was listening to all of you all talk about this right we 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 yearn for though for finding those moments of representation we feel them so deeply we all have our own sort of backgrounds in terms of interacting with our latina heritage right to varying degrees and what occurred to me was we are right the four of us and also sort of our i don't know what to call us cohorts our it's not a generational thing necessarily right but our sort of chunk of time in the games industry there's a lot of folks just like us who did not have as strong a tie to their heritage as perhaps they now want who also cried at Miles Morales and in the heights right and who want to see more of that and you know i had the great fortune to be able to write for um a new TTRPG, a new tabletop role-playing game um, that's, I don't know when it's getting published, hopefully sometime in the next six months or so. Uh, but I got to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I got to write uh, several different factions and one of them was the Latine faction. And I had a great time and it was so exciting to get to put pieces of my family and do all this research and this and that. But there was always, right, this like low key stress fear that I was going to do it wrong right? That finally we get a chance. I get this chance to do this thing for us and I'm going to screw it up, right? And I maybe I did. I don't know. We'll find out when it comes out, right? But I think that what would have helped me in that moment that now hearing you all talk about this, what would have really helped me to remember is that like we are all sort of figuring out, we all know we want representation. Um, we all have a vague sense of what that needs to look like and probably a much clearer sense of what it shouldn't look like. But like, none of us have a good roadmap, particularly, right, Latine Americans who have this level of remove from our cultures, from our home nations, from our whatever, right? There, it's, there's not a good roadmap and we are making it up and people are all the time saying, you know, you want this representation, here's this chance. And it's scary, but I think we have to forgive ourselves a little bit and remember this conversation that actually we're all sort of figuring out what that has to look like. And we're all probably gonna screw it up to some extent or another. And and I think about, you know, Lynn writing that show. And I don't think I don't think he wrote it knowing exactly where people were gonna cry, right? Yeah. And I don't, but but I think he wrote what he knew. And he, I mean, he's a very talented writer, of course, but he did his best at representing his community, his familia, his thing, his culture. And there are plot holes, there are problems, <laughs> you know, having done the show as many times as I have, like we could do an hour panel on that, right? On how it isn't always the greatest Sign example me of representation, right? But it means so much to so many of us because he did what he knew and that was enough, right? So I think as we start talking about representation and what we want and how we can get it, I think it, it at least for me, it makes me feel a lot more comfortable knowing, right, that we're going to stumble. We don't know it. There is no reason for us to have all of the answers to this right now. Um, and that's okay. I don't, that wasn't really an answer to your question. It was the longest, like, <laughs> pre-preface. <laughs> disclaimer anyone's ever heard but like we're spanish I couldn't stop thinking we're about it go after... in directions yeah <laughs> right exactly we're just gonna talk but I... <laughs> but I couldn't stop thinking about that as you all were talking about the the levels of remove from your families and your cultures and 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 how it is still anyway important to all of us right so that's Do it. Go, Val. Go. Do it. I know. I keep no, seeing. Can you see me? We, we see the oh, wheels yeah. turn. No. <laughs> I was like, no. Okay, hold on. I can't. Don't, you, you can't see it. Trust your wheels. Um, they're turning. 
That's right. <laughs> Well, it's more like I, for me, I, cause I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer. So my big passion is that all of my worlds are inspired by my identity and, you know, being biracial Mexican American and stuff like that. I have so much stress that I'm going to get that wrong, <laughs> you know, and you don't get put, like, I, I still haven't gotten anything published. I'm, I'm trying to make that work. And it's just that, that fear of like, I am the sole representation and I'm half white. I don't want to be the sole represent I am not the person you know what I mean like so it's just it can be a little scary so when it comes to representation I don't want to be it weirdly if that makes sense mm -hmm. like I I want there to be a variety and and just not you know be like oh that that white looking person is good we'll take them like <laughs> mm. <laughs> so that was my thought attached to that man I super get it I was thinking about two things too with like Indivi like when we are the writers and when we are the storytellers and when we are people, you know, we're playing a tabletop game. Like we're playing D&D. &D. I wrote a character. I'm putting them in this world. And like where what I see in representation usually done wrong uh, or in a way that I don't identify with, there's always going to be something that I don't identify with. Like I'll talk about Cemetery Boys. It was a, a book that came out uh, in 2020 at one point and I ended up not loving it. Uh, because it was a individual perspective that I saw the editor's hands on. It's a great book. I loved reading it, but I could see where it was like, this has been tailored to an audience that is probably white and female, and I'm neither white nor female. Like, I'm just not, I'm not hitting, it's not clicking for me, and that's okay. But like, when I see representation fail, I see large corporations sort of sticking their hands in there and going like, I'm going to make this casting decision and it's just going to be a Mexican character, but we're going to cast a Puerto Rican person or it's going to be a, a Puerto Rican person. We're going to cast a Mexican person. And like, that's where the problems are. Like it's when the casting decisions are made incorrectly or like the end of Falcon Winter Soldier, where we see the mouse, like just come down and grab the point and throw it out the window. Like you can tell that the large decision-making to be safe are where it gets wrong. To be like PC, that's where it goes wrong because when we're individuals and we're writing the story and we're bringing things in, it's almost always gonna be right. Like Lin-Manuel Miranda, Lin Miranda might have made some really good heart-wrenching decisions in In the Heights and he does all over the place because he's writing one perspective. He's writing just from him. But like when there's a lot of writers in the room and there's that filter, that's when I say in, as a Latino and as somebody who is in a Latina community, it means a lot more to do it wrong and accept the idea that there's going to be a ripple and accept the idea that like as an individual, we're bringing one perspective and everybody around us has got to be cool with the concept that we're bringing in a lot of issue. We're bringing in a big perspective and they've got to be cool with that. Um, I was on a tabletop gaming project where I was like, okay, cool. My characters speak Spanish. I would really, and it was set in a Western. And I'm like, my character speaks Spanish. I really want him to speak Spanish. I really like want him to be a Mexican character who has emigrated to the United States. And I want to tell that story because it's my family story. That's my story. That's what I want to talk about. Um, like becoming a Chicano. And the DM was super cool with it. And later as the project went on, uh, we got some feedback that was like, oh, well, so you've like put Spanish colonialism in your like art, your Western. I can't not bring that with me. Like being in this body and telling that story, I can't not bring the pain of uh, diaspora. Like I can't not bring the issue of Spanish colonialism. I can't not bring the concept that like, my character or my writing is impacted by um, income inequality and stereotype and language barrier and all of that stuff comes with us as we write. And all the white people in the room that are trying to be the puppets and are trying to make the decisions and make things more PC have got to be okay with that and have got to be cool with a successful single Latino perspective or small Latino perspective because then it ends up being authentic and then it ends up being relatable. And this has been a very long soapbox, but <laughs> that's kind of what soapbox. I was thinking. They were smart Thank enough you. to give us two hours. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
actually Vic, as you were talking, I yeah. thought of the perfect polar opposite to in the Ooh. heights. Um I'm about to throw a lot of shade. No, I didn't see it. It doesn't matter. I didn't need to. It's Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. Uh knew exactly where you were going. Yeah. Because <laughs> Okay, the first one happened. Did I love it? Of course I did. I was a teenager when I saw it. Like, hello? The first time I thought I saw myself on screen. <laughs> not not getting into that. Um, but then it was Steven Spielberg that decided, uh, yeah, let's let's make it again. Okay, not a great decision, but you know, whatever. All it took was me seeing, like Vic was saying, the casting for me to just raise my eyebrows. And then I saw Puerto Rican flags all over the place in New York City. In 1952, and in wait, 52, what? Wait, hold on, go back. <laughs> what? Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. That's that's what the set looked like. So, for those that don't know, in 1952, if you had a flag on the island, the FBI dragged you away, and you were not seen again. You were imprisoned. You were quite possibly killed. So, that was literally the only scene that I needed to see of like, oh, you decided to put Puerto Rican flags all over New York City in 1952. You sure about that? I didn't need to see it because I already knew that there was just such a profound lack of cultural understanding of the time of my people that I didn't need, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need to see more. I was fine. So that would be an excellent example of representation done wrong. Um, When you just don't ask us. When you just don't ask us. Absolutely. Or like the research is not there. And it's like, it's disrespectful, actually, if you're, yeah. if the research is straight up not there. Um, I um, was very also <laughs> like, it's vindicating when somebody lights up when you're like, yeah, man, I really wish that they would cast like a Mexican as a Mexican. I really just wish that they would, like, I really wish they would cast a Puerto Rican as a Puerto Rican person mm -hmm. so that we can have some Tino like rep in here. Yeah. Uh, Marvel is, Marvel's right now doing me some crimes. They're really doing me some crimes. Yeah, that movie, I, I haven't, I didn't see it either. Uh, and and yes, a great example. And it's also, I think, uh, a good example of what we were talking about before, right? Which is that like, I, okay, I'm going to preface this by saying I agree with everything that we've said about this movie. I have a lot of very close friends who were in that movie. Um, they were in my, in the Heights, mostly dancers in the ons, mostly the, the dancers in the shark, ensemble the sharks of the puerto ricans right yes i'm a musical theater person i don't know that as bad anyway Imagine. Um, <laughs> right and some of them were puerto rican and talking mm -hmm. to them about that process was so fascinating right and i don't want to speak out of school too much i don't want to i don't want to uh, try and you know i don't want to misrepresent their experiences but what i do feel comfortable saying is right there was a lot of like i don't know Right, we get to do this. That's awesome. We're remaking yeah. it. I am a Puerto Rican. I am doing these dances. I am telling this story that like is full of problems, but like is still a story about a Puerto Rican person, right? So like for them, that was great. And then there were flags, and then there was not right. There was generalized research on things, and that right, all of these other things. And you know, they all did the movie because, of course, they did the movie. Yeah, because. Uh, what are they gonna do? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what are you gonna do? Not get paid? Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, pay me to make the project with the Spanish people in it. Done. Right. And and they were excited, right? And they were excited to see it, and they were excited for their friends to see it. And I don't hold any of that against them because what they did was awesome. They did good, talented, hard work, and I love my friends because they all could have a cogent conversation about like this was one of the best things in our career to date, and also it's a problem. Right. Um, and and I respect them so much for being able to hold both of those things, because that's what we're talking about. Right. That's where a lot of pressure gets put on us as the people who have to do the representing, whether it's the writing, the directing, the choreography or just being on screen. Right. Whether it's the playing of the game, the writing of the game, the whatever. It's ah, oh, we have to navigate so much and please be kind and generous to yourself. Right. Because. Uh, whatever we contribute is is gonna be a step of progress right and we're gonna get it wrong and that's okay because we'll learn from that too and i think they learned from their participation in the movie you know i'm not gonna say whether or not mr spielberg has learned a, an important life lesson 
but also I don't care, right? Because I think their participation was an important part of the story too. Oh yeah. So just wanting to, uh, sorry if I jumped ahead of anyone, uh, wanted to kind of circle back around. I love this conversation about representation. Just kind of bring it honing in specifically to uh, TTRPG and or gaming. Uh, so we talked about some movies, but what about, and then uh, songs gave a nod to Guacamole, right? And then the Miles Morales game, the actual like game, I think is also great. Can we think? And I'm doing this on purpose. Can we think of any others that are positive representation of Latine culture in gaming and or TTRPG? Um, I do have one other uh, for the tabletop zone. There is a, uh, if you're familiar with Powered by the Apocalypse, it's a 2d6 system that you can sort of skin a ton of stuff onto. Um, there is a skin that actually, since we had our little pre-panel meeting, oh, what was that, a week and a half ago, a week ago, um, I got an email that my Spanish edition of this game is uh, getting shipped and is on the way. Uh, but it's a Powered by the Apocalypse skin called Nawal, uh, and you play Mexican angel hunters, basically, but like not angels, like Judeo-Christian angels. Um, <laughs> And it's really cool. It's sort of set in an alternate modern Mexico. Um, I think actually it's meant to be set in Mexico City. Uh, and it's really cool and talks about Nahual mythology. Nahual is the uh, indigenous word that, that uh, then Spaniards call them the Aztecs, but it's that sort of indigenous culture. Um, but it talks about a lot about their culture and their mythology in the context of like, these things exist and you can hunt them for for you know food and tools and things and that is how you survive uh and i i think it's a very cool game i love that That's your I'm so excited. yeah <laughs> and bookmark on uh -huh. twitter <laughs> um i can think of one in the last uh, couple of years that i there was a lot of, there was representation and some of it was great because I liked the characters and some of it was not so great because I was like, who wrote this? Um, and that <laughs> is Cyberpunk uh, 2077. I was really, I played the whole game uh, with a friend of mine because I was like, all right, I know that this has got a lot, a whole lot of mixed reviews. There's a whole bunch of stuff. I want to put my little transgender hands all over it. Uh, so I played it and there's a funeral in the beginning in which they use the term ofrenda incorrectly. Uh, and it's very strange, but they do a whole funeral for a Latino man. Um, and then there is an entire story with one of the main romances, uh, with a lesbian character named Judy. And I am so deeply in love with her. And I think that her, like, her story was written really well. Um, and it was really interesting to sort of see the game embrace somebody doing a very heavy Spanish accent, um, doing some really interest, like having some really interesting like takes about what it is to learn that you are queer as a young Latino person. Um, but overall, I think that the representation in general was pretty mixed. And that's kind of the way that I've come in to most representation in like major AAA title video games with Spanish characters is that I'm like, I'm glad we're here. I'm glad we're doing this. You're not really saying a lot. There's not much here that's perfect. Uh, and I don't know if anybody else has kind of had that experience uh, or played the game. Val, I saw you kind of react to the, the cyberpunk of it all. Oh, Val, well, do you have something to say about cyberpunk? Um, <laughs> no, I don't know. it's bad uh <laughs> yeah overall i was like this game was okay like um for for me my my big thing though was uh um i got a chance to review far cry 6 and they and that was interesting because they gave me the opportunity because i'm latina but like i'm mexican american and that whole setting is largely cuban inspired and i'm like 
I'm not the person you should have given. Like, you should have asked, like, someone from, like, a Cuban-American person or, you know, like, somebody, not me. Um, But it was bad. It was, <laughs> like, I, I, I think it there was some genuine love that was put into it. Like, they did some research. There was a lot of, like, they didn't translate a lot of the Spanish, which was really cool. Um, but it was also just a lot of bad stereotypes and I'm kind of weary of the bad stereotypes at this point. Like everyone's just a drug lord or a gangster. It's just, it is so exhausting. Cause like, is this all we're ever going to get to be in a game? Specifically games. Like, you know, um, I remember I used to play Overwatch a lot and when Sombra came out, I was like, Sombra, my love, my darling. And then, of course, she, you know, every other like Latina who has come out in a game like that is like morally ambiguous, sort of that femme fatale. Like they're all kind of in that same zone of like questionably, <laughs> like they're they're just all this sort of they they just reinforce a lot of bad stereotypes. And it's like, well, I love that this character exists on one hand. Can we have more? <laughs> Could we have something different, <laughs> please? So that's where I'm at with the games industry, like as a whole, when it comes to like Latina representation, I've yelled about it for too long now, but it's my big thing. So just do something different. I promise we have other modes. <laughs> I love when they settings, try to, you know? <laughs> yeah. I love when they try to break the stereotype too. They're like, oh, it's a morally ambiguous, very sexy Latino woman who's oh. going to come here, but, but she's a gamer girl Ooh. and like she's into video games for some reason or like she does computer yeah. stuff and i can name so uh so overwatch sombra judy from cyberpunk uh i'm trying to think of other ones oh the character that was just released um in league of legends i not renata the other one they just released a, it's literally just sombra like it's they just Boop, and put this character in the game. She has a big knife this time. Ooh, wow, yeah, ooh, ooh, spicy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love the conversation that we were having about um all the representation and stuff. Um, and I want to <laughs> do a somewhat of an awkward segue, but I guess it also relates back into mental health. Um, and um, you know this can also affect our, our mental health, how we um, are depicted and stuff like that. Um, however, let's talk about like mental health in our community, right? So mental health in the Latina community. Um, do you feel like you can talk about it represented or you can talk about um, actually like within our community, how it is embraced or not embraced? Um, in your experiences? Um, I kind of think, like, jumping off of Judy's storyline, jumping off of uh, cyberpunk uh, overall, uh, you know, hot button, hot button issue, um, but I think that one of the biggest mental health challenges as I, as coming from the Latina community and um, in uh, seeing it represented in games, there's a huge um, storyline in the game uh where you have to deal with uh, a decision to take somebody's own life um, in cyberpunk. And it is, you know, it, it's AAA title. They're trying to do lots of gritty mental health stuff, but they are talking about mental health and they are talking about everybody's journey and like helping other people and being a support system and like what is good to do and what isn't good to do. And the attempt was there. As a player, when you give a player choices, they become a third level of influence to the storyline and the storyline leaves your hands. When you're writing a tabletop game, when you're writing a video game, when you're writing something that has a player, the story changes based on what the player is doing and your response to it changes based on what the player is doing. So it's good to see a Latino story that does intersect with mental health. But I am always very afraid of minimizing or like the like devil's advocate choice or the like, we're going to talk about this and it's going to be there, but we're not going to say anything about it. And it's just going to exist there and we'll get the brownie points for like putting it in the game. Uh, but we're not going to sort of directly say like, 
yes, young Spanish people are very, very at risk for suicide, suicidal ideation. And we are one of the largest populations of uh, having struggles with mental health and depression. Like, it'll be there, it'll be in the game, but we're not going to specifically say, this is something that this community struggles with. Uh, and that's always a little frustrating to me to see. Um, and always very, it, it feels like we're close. It feels like I'm begging somebody to like, just jump across the divide and like have something big to say about it. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with seeing things represented where I've definitely seen recently a couple of dips, uh, but I need somebody to take the plunge. I would say that like within my own experience, because I we talked a little bit about this already, but um, within my own personal journey with mental health, um, when I ended up struggling after my uh, grandfather died back in middle school, um, I was extremely fortunate and extremely blessed that my mother looked at me and was like, something is wrong. You're going to a psychologist. And I went to a psychologist and it was great. She helped me, got out of there. It took like a year, whatever. Right. However, like that was the first time in my life that I learned who to not say that to, because the response was going to be, Tú no puedes hacer eso, eso de diablo. what does that mean? You can't do that. That's of the devil. And it's just like, but, but, but why? Like, why, why are you throwing, you know, it's not even throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's just throwing me out entirely. I'm just like, okay, but if I need help, why does me needing help have to be of the, de I don't, does not compute, but it's such, you know, an, an older generational thing of just like, we don't get help. We don't ask for help. We never need help stuff in your head. No, you, you will sit and you will be crazy because mm -hmm. you, you, we don't get help for that. It's just like, what? No. No, 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 no. Do, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Stop. Like, no. So, you know, I was super fortunate that I was able to do that. And of course it got that much worse when I revealed to family, like, oh, by the way, I'm studying to be a therapist, but you know, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we're also bridging that divide of like, you know, there's going to be that generation above us, which who knows how long. Um, there's, there's, but there's, there's going to be people in the community that will write, try to write it off as like, you, like, you don't need that. You no, you're not, you're, you don't need that. That's no one needs that. What are you, why are you suggesting that versus people that have taken the time to be like, yeah, no, almost like, like all of us need therapy. You need to stop. <laughs> I don't know that I have too much to add. Um, you know, no, no community, no demographic, no anything, right, uh, is without its its faults. Um, and obviously, mental health is uh, sort of, generally speaking, not much discussed in our community. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing that, like, is part of finding our place in media, in representation, in in uh in games and in and in the media in general is that those are things that we're gonna have to to all sort of grapple with right and and it's amazing and great that we have panels like this right that that clearly the stigma and the the fear uh is not uh, ubiquitous in the latina community and that's awesome and that there are at least five of us who want to come up here and talk about it right now is is huge. But I, but you know, this is uh, this is a thing that that we as a community have to struggle with and have to understand that, like, like with many things, uh, the wisdom of our elders is valuable until it isn't, right? Uh, and and you know, we're not special that that is true for us as Latine people, uh, but it is something that, because because that's true of, of lots of groups, but but it's something that we're going to have to navigate and grapple with and that we're going to feel pushback for when we're trying for this kind of representation, right? Because I think in the second half, we'll talk a little bit about the intersectionality of our experiences as Latine gamers and the way that those different intersections can be represented. Um, and... 
And part of that is just going to be that we're going to learn from those intersections. And this is one of the things that the community at large sort of uh, has got to grapple with. That, me that, that, you know, mental health is a thing that we can all safely, stigma-free discuss uh, whether or not our insert X number of greats grandparents agree with us. <laughs> Feel, see, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think when we uh, come back, we I believe we're about to take a break. Um, when we come back, we can maybe talk about um, those intersectionalities and how that can affect our mental health as well, um, because that is huge usually, is our intersectionalities and our mental health and how that affects us. Um, so yeah, I believe we're going on break now. Hopefully I didn't jump the gun and go too soon. No. Uh, so I'll see you all back in 10 minutes.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, before the break, uh, what I said we were going to talk about now was um, intersectionalities and how that can affect our mental health. Um, so I'm kind of going to give a little of my own story. Um, I am a first generation um, kid. Uh, my I'm actually half Mexican, but the way I say this is kind of strange, so hopefully this doesn't offend anyone. I'm half Mexican, full person of color. My mom is from Mexico and my dad is from India. Um, but I grew up with my Indian heritage, or sorry, my Mexican heritage um, being my culture. Um, I was a little bit estranged from my, my dad's side. Um, so like, I just say I'm Mexican. Um, and you know, when folks ask me my culture, it's just Mexican. Um, but uh, in regards to that, you know, identity, I've never felt like I was, um, fortunately, my, I've never felt in my family that I was like, you know, um, less than or not Mexican enough. Um, just I was fortunate to grow up in a, in a household and an extended family that didn't kind of otherize me because I was half. Um, but... Uh, in regards to intersectionalities and mental health, having the intersectionality of being someone that identifies as queer, as well as someone that now identifies as um, uh, non-binary slash trans um, has been a real struggle in my mental health. Um, fortunately, I'm at a really good place right now. Um, but you know, when I kind of started coming to the realization that I was um, queer and, and then later on, like even after that being like, oh wait, shoot, it's not just that I'm queer. I also happen to be like gender diverse and trans at the same time was like a whole thing in itself. Um, and my mental health got really bad. Um, it kind of beat the trigger point for me was a unfortunate um, unforeseen loss of one of my tias, one of my aunts. Um, she, you know, out of the blue was, we were told that she had stage five, um, cancer and like two weeks later she passed away. It was very rapid. It was very quick. Um, I have always not dealt with, um, death and loss easily or well in general. Um, which is kind of interesting because my family, and I don't know if this is a Latino thing or not, but we're always talking about death, right? And like, you know, there's Dia de los Muertos, like, you know, that's a huge holiday. Um, but so like, it wasn't, I don't know, it just hit me really hard for some reason. And that's when I was like, oh, I really need to go to therapy, even though I kind of had this inkling that I needed to go to therapy. Um years before that because I like knew I was kind of like depressed but didn't really want to admit it because that doesn't exist in our family doesn't exist in our family um and just how we never ever in my family talked about mental health it just wasn't a thing uh you know and then being first generation I usually had to figure out a lot of things on my own. Like my dad, he never um, even finished middle school. My mom, she finished high school, but never went to college. Um, so it's like I had to find out a lot of things on my own. I had to find out how to apply to college. I had to find out which colleges were good and like what a good career was and all that stuff. And I also had to find out about mental health services on my own because there was no way that I could ask my family no way <laughs> because then it would be like songs of saying you know is el diablo like stuff mm -hmm. like that so um this is my own little personal story just to summarize how for me in my little corner of the latina community it was not spoken of like even if I had to seek out help on my own like I was so confused. I was like, where do I go? How do I find someone, A, that's going to help me through this grief and loss, B, going to accept me for all my identities at the same time that I'm like trying to go through. 
as well as I had to do my own work getting through this learned, like, hammered into me idea that mental health is bad, but the thing that's worse is medication for mental health in my family, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I really, at the moment, that moment in my life needed antidepressants and uh, just recently also got a diagnosis of ADHD and need meds for it but like now I'm at a point where I'm like these are great they help me so much <laughs> but like you know that when I started being like wow like geez I don't know I think I'll not take medication because even though I'm like in the deepest darkest worst place in my life where I am even um, having suicidal ideation like no like these pills are like so terrible for me you know and having to come to terms with that um, <clears throat> so that's just a big, long-winded, small, heavy <laughs> story to dump on you all, um, to kind of just give you a little snapshot of my own experience with mental health and, you know, the things that I was raised with in regards to mental health and wanting to kind of have a conversation of what that can look like about, you know, seeking mental health like was it easier for you was it difficult for you what would you have wished you would have kind of known like I wished that I would have known and I didn't know this till later that you don't have to stay with that one therapist if you don't like them you can as I like to call it shop around (laughs) for therapists like just the same with the doctor you know um so I want to go ahead and open up the conversation if anyone wants to go off of that my experiences were there's it's such a specific intersection of things so like I mentioned I'm a childhood cancer survivor um and I'm not going to get too into that and it's just in the sense of like it's really upsetting topic but nobody really talks about like um you know uh, CPTSD so I have CPTSD uh depression ADHD apparently um (laughs) social anxiety um and just like a ton of social anxiety and that's also baked into that trauma of like all the medical stuff and and my not there weren't words when I was younger like I'm in my 30s there no one talks you know back then about anxiety or depression or like those weren't things you had or did um so I had to go and learn all that myself and then you know learn that what you know, complex, you know, PTSD even was, I didn't even know what that was (laughs) until like two years ago. And then my doctor was like, yeah, that sounds like you fit the bill for that. You could have told me that (laughs) a long time ago. Thanks. Um, So, you know, like support is just, it's so you have to go and find it. And like, how do you even go about that? So that's, you know, where like community really can come in because people were like, hey, did you know CPTSD is a thing? Did you know this is ADHD? You know, like, <laughs> and and really the internet was my big, like I learned about, you know, being bisexual, then eventually like, I think I'm non-binary and like all that stuff from there and having that resource. So for me, it's kind of, I had to go and find that elsewhere and that was always really hard. So that's why stuff like this and panels like this and communities like this are so important. So yeah. <laughs> Didn't let you hideo say words first this time. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll I'll take a stab from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I, for better or worse, I guess, uh, sit on a board of trustees for a, a union health plan, and so have a lot of like technical knowledge about that sort of thing. And and one thing that like any chance I get, it's been around for years now, but any chance that I get, I remind folks um, about something called the Mental Health Parity Act, uh, which was an act of Congress that uh, basically, to m- vastly simplify it, um, basically says that health insurances have to cover mental health uh, uh, treatment and prevention and, and uh, services in the same way, which of course, what in the hell does that mean? But in the same way that they cover physical health benefits. Um, and that opened the door, particularly for folks who are on like state exchange plans to finally have decent coverage. So if you are a person who um, has avoided seeking mental health treatment uh, or support because of the cost and because the insurance is a nightmare, and it's been a few years since you have tried, I would encourage you to try again 
if that was part of your hurdle, because that act has a lot of folks in the background, right, who are administering the plan, sort of scrambling to make sure that we are adhering to the new law. Um, but it's so very helpful as a as a participant of a health plan um, to just know that mental health has to be covered and the way in which your insurance does it, you should look into, but it's there. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Um, the other thing I'll say is I live in New York City and I, um, a lot of my break in mental health treatment uh, was about wanting to find someone who I wouldn't feel, um, who I, who I thought would uh, sort of default understand a little more about me and my identity as a person. So I spent a lot of time looking for uh, queer and or POC, prefer preferably Latine therapists. Um, and that, I mean, finding the right fit is, is, a, is a difficult thing, can be a difficult thing anyway. And then I was sort of adding on all of these conditions that this person had to meet. Um, and in some ways, you know, in some ways it then became this sort of spiral of you're just making it that much harder on yourself. You're never going to find it. Are you trying to not find it? Or is this a, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, but, but then I found it, right? And it's actually amazing. Um, I spoke with, with several therapists and some of them fit all of those criteria, and some of them, some of them, and some of them, none of them. And they were all careful, capable professionals. Um, but I was really lucky to find this place in New York called, uh, let me make sure I get the full name of the place right, um, the Gender and Sexuality Therapy Center. Um, and they have a ton of POC therapists and they specialize particularly in like uh, uh, sexual health and and uh, gender issues and all of that sort of thing. And I thought, well, this is sort of perfect. And yes, I, I live, you know, in a large metropolitan area, but these types of services do exist. And so if that's important to you, if you feel like, if you know you're going to get in there and some of the things that you're going to talk about you know, feel like maybe they have, like, you would love this baseline understanding of othering or of whatever it is, right, that, that is part of your identity. It's out there. It, it does make it more difficult, but if you have the bandwidth, if you have the time, if you have the resources, um, you know, uh, don't, don't give up on that. It, it does exist out there. Um, yeah. Uh, I kind of have had a, a similar experience in Orlando um, with like a lot of my mental health journey and finding good care and finding uh, even somewhere to look for good mental health care is a challenge, especially when you are queer and looking for somebody who understands that experience and you're a Latino and you're looking to find somebody who understands that experience or you are non-binary or trans and you're trying to navigate uh, what even as a well person, even, even as a healthy person who's like, hi, I would like therapy to go along with my mental health improvement journey of transitioning. That in itself is a difficult thing to find um, because you want, or at least I wanted in my journey, my focus to be on a, a, a handling my journey as somebody who has overcome quite a lot. I'm not in crisis, but I want to prevent myself from being in crisis. I'm seeking something to continue bettering and not just putting band-aids on things. Because when I was growing up, a lot of my, and in my Latina experience, a lot of my family are very much like, similar to to different of um, what Alex was describing, where like, there was a standard of care, there was, we're gonna go to the hospital, you can get a medication for that, but that will fix you. And that's as far as it goes, where it was very like, okay, well, they're not very medically literate. They, uh, I was the first generation in my family to go to college. Uh, I was the first generation in my family to uh, graduate high school um, at, with any ambition to go to college. Um, and then I ended up dropping out of college. So like, we're still not there, we're still not fixed. But the medical literacy of like, oh, well, we just have this family doctor and we've been going to see him for nine years and your dentist has halitosis, but he can absolutely take care of your teeth. It was one of those situations. So being in Orlando and living through the Pulse Massacre, um, it's astounding how many more uh, resources that have popped up and that have struggled to maintain funding now that we're approaching the six year anniversary or seven year anniversary of one of the largest hate crimes in the United States. 
Um, but the community did start to build itself up and has started to have longstanding uh, resources that you can turn to if you are looking to find somebody. So I went to the center in Orlando. Um, I think their long name is the Center for LGBTQIA Health and Wellness something. Um, but they just go the center of Orlando. And I was able to find my therapist who is a white woman, but who works through the center and has worked mostly with queer Latino men post pulse and about their mental health. Uh, and that was a huge, huge, huge stepping off point coming from a place that is not medically literate and is not literate in trying to find good mental health services. Uh, but even if you are in a smaller metro area or in a uh, larger kind of flat breadth of the entire third of the state that makes up Orlando, um, the services are out there. Uh, and even if you're outside of that area, they serve all of Florida. So even if you think like, mm, I might not post 2020, um, it was a lot easier to find stuff that was remote and online. Uh, you just kind of had to know where to look for it. And that literacy is the hardest part, but it is there. Yeah, for sure. I don't have a ton to add, but definitely, especially post-2020. Like, I know therapists that have already said, like, I'm never going back to an office. I, I will see mm -hmm. all of you virtual forever. Um, but that just means that, like, okay, so maybe one person, I'm, like, in the greater D.C. area, maybe one person, you know, we're not crossing state lines, but, like, one person in Northern Virginia can now see somebody in Richmond, can now see somebody in Virginia Beach, can now see somebody in Roanoke from her living room. You know, so like, yeah, I've de it's definitely been able to open up accessibility for sure with the advantage of getting to have it be virtual. But, you know, also, you you also have to know, like, if you're that type of person um, that can, like, be down with that, because some people can't. Some people will see you on, like, you'll, you'll see your therapist on a screen and be just like, nope, I need to actually, like, no, you're physically in the room with me. Like this is, I'm, I'm floating in space. Like I can't, I can't do this. And that's, but that's, again, that's fine. Like, no, it is completely fine for you to shop for your therapist. It's completely fine for you to fire your therapist. Like there, there's definitely little bits that like people don't talk about it, but like, no, it's, it's completely valid. And, and um, I actually just had a situation with my husband where um, he was shopping for a laptop. Now I love my husband. He's a picky picky individual when it comes to laptops and I was like you know what it's fine so uh we just got through our third one hopefully this is the one but like what he started to realize was like oh wait I actually care if this be like because I I was like you want this spec this spec this spec this spec right fine then he started to realize oh wait like I want the keyboard to be able to do this oh wait this speaker's bad like are there ones with better speakers and I'm just sitting here like you know what I can give you a computer with twice the specs that I just gave you, but you're not going to care because what you need is a good speaker. There's a good keyboard. It's the exact same thing with a therapist. You could have a therapist with like credentials that are a mile long. They're set to work with every single person under the sun. If you just don't fuck with them, don't fuck with them. Leave. It's okay. They're not going to be mad. They're not going to be in their feelings. And it, you know what? If they are, that's for them to figure out with their therapist. By the way, therapists have therapists. So like, don't like, you don't have to worry about that part of it. You are allowed to leave. You're allowed to shop around. You're allowed to have more than one. Why not? You know, like it make your treatment make it a little weird, but you know, it's fine. Um, there's people that, so like I said, I'm, I'm a music therapist. So like, there are absolutely people that like go see their psychologist and then come process in a different way with a music therapist. You know, it could be that you just need a different medium. There's art therapy, there's dance therapy, there's drama therapy. So it could be that like, maybe the medium of sit in a chair and talk isn't your medium. And that's totally fine too. Like the world's your oyster. I promise they're out there. But yeah, finding them can suck, but you're totally allowed to just be picky. Be so picky. This is a person that you're trying to help, like piece your life back together. You know, at whatever with whatever that means. Um, one of my favorite things, like, uh, one of my favorite, like, memes about a therapist is a person sitting in the couch, of course she is, um, uh, talking, and as she's talking, uh, there's yarn coming out of her mouth. I'm a crocheter, so, like, this one resonates with me very hard. And she, as this yarn is coming out, the therapist sitting across the room is, like, knitting with the yarn and, like, making it all pretty into a thing that then the person sees afterwards and is like, oh. It makes sense.
adults now. So, like, you have to allow that to, like, allow that space to exist, but make sure it's with someone that you actually want to do it with. Because if you don't want to do that work with that person, you won't do that work with that person. And you're wasting a huge amount of time and effort. But no, you're totally allowed to shop, totally allowed to fire people, and totally allowed to, if, take the time you need. If it takes you a month, cool. If it takes you one session, also cool. If it takes you five years, cool. If it takes you 10 years, cool. If it doesn't matter as long as you are still feeling like you're progressing and you're feeling like you're getting something out of it. Let it take whatever time it needs to take. Yeah, absolutely. Something that um, I've talked about with fellow school counselors or um, I said at the beginning, I'm um, in my program to become a therapist again. Um, sorry, I got distracted and then I got derailed. Um, <laughs> uh, something that we have talked about is how, unfortunately, since we're kind of lumped in with the medical field, we have that um, kind of uh, stigmatization uh, in a way or the expectation that you get a diagnosis. You have a certain amount of time to quote unquote fix that diagnosis and then you're done when that's not the case with mental health, right? It's different than if you like break a bone. Breaking a bone will have a certain period of healing, and but one can argue that sometimes it will take longer than that. But mental health, for sure, it's so like flowy that there's no way that you can know how long mental health is going to take. And sometimes that's an issue when it comes to insurance, um, because sometimes insurance is like, oh, we'll pay for 10 sessions, and that's it, right? So that's a huge barrier that we meet when it comes to mental health. Um, something uh, that I wanted to add was if we have any youth by chance in the chat, you know, being someone that worked with youth, I have to throw this out there. Um, if you don't have access to therapy, because, you know, like in my youth, I wouldn't have had because of my family's beliefs, um, seek out your school counselor, or they used to be called guidance counselors, but we're trying to not call them guidance counselors anymore. So um, school counselor, seek out your school counselor or your school psychologist. Um, usually they have the same confidentiality. Um, I know I did same confidentiality barriers where they won't tell your parents anything unless, you know, harm to self, harm to others. Um, then they will have to breach that confidentiality. But just so in case there's any youth in there, uh, in the chat by chance. And also um, anyone who maybe is still on parents insurance companies um, when you're just going off to college. Um, usually your college will have a counseling center um, and they also don't have to tell your parents that you went there. Uh, just thinking of resources. Uh, and then something else I wish I knew was that there is also a lot of community um, counseling centers that are on sliding scales. So if you feel like you can't afford it, don't let that stop you. Seek out those places that offer sliding scales because sometimes that sliding scale, the monetary um, that value that you have to pay will be zero because you tell them I can't. Um, so just wanted to put that little plug in there. Um, uh, something that since we're kind of getting close to our wrap up time, unfortunately, this has been a lot of fun. We still have like 25 minutes, but I want to give us like a little, um, ending conversation. Uh, first I'd like to see if there's anything that you would like to see, um, speci specifically for Latino mental health in the future. Like something for me that we've already kind of began talking about is less stigmatization about just talking about mental health. For me, that's a huge one. I think um, going back, we, we talked a lot about this, but I think finding, uh, I look forward to sort of the, the profession, the mental health profession and, uh, learning more about um, the particular, I, I don't want to say traumas, but like experiences, let's say, right, of 
first and in particular first and second generation Latin Americans, right? And how that affects us. Um, I would love to see, you know, a real understanding of, and, and, and this exists and we can just find more of it as we discover more of it, but a real understanding of what, how these things affect us in ways that we don't know, how our cultures, how our, even if we aren't connected to our culture, how the way that the pervasive, pervading color, cotton culture others us, right? How it makes us feel different and how that affects often subconsciously we talked about like um i think that you were talking about how at one point um like assimilation right we're all sort of to some extent or another like made to desire assimilation and now perhaps we desire less of that how is that like giant childhood turnaround like how does that very closely and specifically inform the things that we have to sort of deal with in terms of our mental health um yeah that would that would be my wish My wish is on the back end, actually, which um, sounds a little backwards, but my wish is on the uh, side of uh, therapist training. Now, there's a huge movement. Uh, definitely. So I, I've been a, a, a music therapist for five years. So I, definitely within the five years and probably a little prior to, I just can't speak for prior to, of um, cultural competency. Um, I would really love it if cultural competency didn't um, consist of a couple sentences in that one textbook where it says like, well, if you're working with Latino uh, clients, they, they might like be more emotional. So you need to be sensitive to that. I would love for it to not just be a couple sentences like that. I would love for it to, you know, first of all, come from us. Um, and second of all, actually address what our needs could be, but not what they are, because there is no one thing that they are, because we are not a monolith. So my yeah, my need is from like the therapist training end. Like let's let's work over there, please. And thanks. I guess for me it would be since I'm not as familiar with like the therapist side of things or anything like that would be just to normalize you know Latina people in like media just having you know emotions that aren't like again the the sombra-esque stuff you know to sort of normalize that we're people <laughs> you know um, we're not spices exactly yes so just things like that just the normalization of you know and, and also normalizing and I think this is a general thing in general but like it does apply here just normalizing that therapy is not a big evil thing um because that was definitely something when I was growing up it was like oh you don't need that that means something's wrong with you and it's like can we get rid of like you know changing that stigma which I think has been improving over time but like definitely normalizing that like therapy is not this big evil thing um would be awesome <laughs> so yeah yeah um mine is or my want is is pretty much the same um and it it, it really comes down to seeking breadth uh it really comes down to seeking like i would love to see more perspectives and an understanding that being intersectional is understanding many viewpoints that come from different places so like latino people are not monoliths individually and latina cultures are not all the same so understanding where somebody is coming from even if they are of exactly the same socioeconomic background their heritage experiences may be different their relationship with grief may be different their relationship with themselves their bodies their pride may be different um and i think that you know really understanding the way that like capitalism eats us uh and the way that our backgrounds shape us um needs to come from many many points of reference and not just the one not just the default not just the we are spicy uh and our emotions are horny or angry uh but you know i i think that 
that is much easier said than done, but it is something I really want to see. And I hope that certain recent project success uh, is a good starting off point uh, for that. And I'm really hoping to see more than what we have been getting uh, in media representation uh, so that we can start having these bigger conversations about the way that our um, backgrounds influence our mental health and the way that our identities are shaped by all these different factors. Uh, Vic, I'm reminded about how you were saying, and this was kind of like earlier, maybe before the break, I'm not really sure. I'm bad with time. Um, Same. Thank you, ADHD. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, just being really open about <laughs> diagnoses. Um, how um, the Latina population has uh, statistically like the highest rates for you know um, mental health and diagnoses and all that stuff. Um, I did actually a a, a paper <laughs> on us uh, on how specifically um, Latina women actually have the highest suicidal ideation rate um, out of all the demographics. Um, and I thought that that was so interesting because I, you know, I kind of wondered like, oh, like why this population? And yet I was so stunned to know that because of the fact of how little we talk about mental health, you know? So to me, it was like, whoa, like we're the, um, you know, Latina women are the biggest population. Um, and I don't even think it was just ideation. I no, it was just ideation, not, um, actually, um, going through with it. Um, but you know, I think about how, um, sometimes we hear the word machismo, right? And we think about it in reference to um, a cisgendered Latina man. However, how that infiltrates, just like with, you know, um, the patriarchy, it infiltrates everyone of all genders. Um, and how in my family, this was true. Even my mom felt the need to not express emotions, whether it was sadness, um, or sometimes even joy or love sometimes, you know, like being outwardly open with their emotions because of the machismo. Um, and I don't know, I'm trying, I just uh, saw a message that there's a, a version for, for women, and I'm trying to read it, but I've never heard it so bear with me I apologize if I say it wrong but it's marinanismo marinanismo is apparently the machismo equivalent for women I learned something new today thank you <laughs> um so you know and how that so heavily affects mental health um again just like you know patriarchy and all these other systematic things. Um, I don't know, I guess I just want to hear reactions if, you know, bringing up machismo and marianismo, marinamismo. I cannot say that word. <laughs> I've never heard that great. before, but I also learned anything today. That's right. Doing great. Right. I'm glad so that I want to hear kind of like your reactions knowing that, you know, um, they're the uh, Latina women are the highest um, at risk for suicidal ideation and also how like maybe we hadn't thought of um, machismo and that other word that I can't say I apologize <laughs> um, affecting us and how kind of maybe like what your reactions are to thinking about that. I have a lot of thoughts about this. Uh, I think about this one a lot uh, because as a trans guy, as, as a trans mask individual, um, I've had to unpack this a lot with my family because they're incredibly, you know, one of the things that we approach as we come out as trans people, and this is not a universal experience, but this is something I've read a lot about um, and something I am living right now is uh, when you are confronted with your family's grief and my um 
my experience as a Latina person in this uh, realm has been very much that there are safe emotions through the machismo and through the marinismo that like we are allowed to have and it's um, disappointment and it's uh, a lot of there is sadness there, there is grief there, uh, and that that's in a safe emotion. Um, there's some emotions that we can talk about, uh, and it's a lot of them are like, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed, uh, but there wasn't, a, and there's a, also, a, a, you're allowed to experience a lot of joy and happiness, um, but there's not very much in between where we kind of bridge these gaps. Um, because it, we're very much, uh, in my experience, meant to process things alone. And I think a lot about that um, in the experience of uh, being colonized as a people to be very Catholic, which is something that I think a lot of Mexican people uh, sit on. Um, and I can only speak to that experience, but we, yeah, I was raised very Catholic, and I think that that's very emblematic of why this is a problem, where we don't have a bridge, we don't talk about things on the, in the in-between, when we're coming from, oh, that's new information to joy and acceptance, that in-between doesn't exist, because we're supposed to go in a room and talk to a priest and say what sin we did, and then we're absolved, and everything's fine, uh, and, you know, colonialism made that happen, it super did, uh, but also, we're still dealing with it as modern families. Um, and I think that the shift from I would like to make this change for myself and I would like to unpack that and watching my family start to put those like, oh, well, if you're like a guy, then we're going to put these new sets of rules on you and we're going to put this new expectation on you. And the emotionality that I was experiencing from my uh, my family especially my mom uh she felt like she couldn't relate to me anymore because she was like oh well I no longer like I can't call you hija anymore so like I don't have that anymore and there's a loss of that kind of experience so it is very interesting to sort of see and recognize that that is absolutely one of the filters that subconsciously uh people are kind of living through and dealing with and trying to I'm trying to have the conversation about the middle point uh especially right now um I don't know if anybody else has any sort of reactions to that but that's been something I've been thinking about a lot I mean with my dad's family like they don't even talk to me like I don't even know the story of how his family got so fractured that they didn't want anything to do with me or him and um he passed away and I was very little so just things like that where you get that um fracturing of of families because they don't want to talk about it they don't you don't talk about it you know what I mean and it's just things like that so I definitely have like an adjacent experience in that a sense of like there's certain rules you know just certain things you don't talk about like I've met them twice and they were like, we don't really know what to do with you. <laughs> um, so it, just things like that, where you can kind of struggle to have that connection and really like, talk about things. So, yeah. yeah. Hearing that um, it's Latino women that have the highest rate of suicidal ideation really makes me reflect on my own family. Um, my dad's side in particular, my great grandfather completed suicide and a cousin of mine, yeah, cousin of mine also did a solid 15 years later, I think. And, you know, these two men have always kind of been like the emblem of such in the family, right? Like, I don't know, but for those two, how many women in that family have been thinking the exact same thing and haven't told a soul or have said, sure, I can think that all I want, but I'm cooking dinner for five kids. So like that ain't gonna happen. It just, it, yeah, it really just makes me reflect a lot. Um, and it's answers I'll never get. Right. Um, whether because, you know, certain family members have already passed away just, you know, from old age or from whatever, but like also because, no, I'm not going to go directly to my grandmother and be like, hey, I wanna. <laughs> you know, like that's just not going to happen. 
in for like a million reasons. But, you know, hearing that and like, especially um, Vic, uh, when you brought up like, you know, the whole colonialism aspect. Um, hi, I'm from the uh, world's oldest colony. I'm from Puerto Rico, where um, oh, yeah. my entire heart is there right now. Uh, there's another hurricane coming. It is almost five years to the day since Hurricane Maria. Do you know what has already happened? Over 98,000 people don't have power and it hasn't even gotten there yet. Mm-hmm. All of that is a symptom of colonialism. And especially for the island in particular, God damn, I would want to die too. Like it's, it's exhausting isn't, the, isn't even close to the right word. Like it is just so overbearing and overpresent and feels so hopeless that like, what are you supposed to do? You know, like, yeah, hearing that statistic, I just, I think of home for sure. Yeah, it's super not shocking. And I, please interrupt me. Um, it, it's super not shocking, but like, I don't know if you guys have felt this, but since 2016, since the, the 2016 Trump election, like the amount of trauma that the Latina community is currently holding, yes. because yes. Uh, many of us are Mexican in this chat, like the influence of ha- being basically walled off, uh, very, very, very difficult to just listen to it day in and day out. And it's microaggression. It's not very big or very direct but it's micro direction and then it becomes direct and it's scary. And then as a Puerto Rican person, as somebody who lives in Florida, like we've had a huge population boom from Puerto Rican people who have moved here, Cuban people who have moved here because there just isn't a home anymore and housing costs are going up and everything is really difficult and it's very really easy to be angry about that. Um, but the community trauma is there and is very present. Um, and man, I feel for all of us because of that build over the last couple of years. And that's just something that I've noticed because it's got big enough to like not not notice. There's no way that we can say, oh yeah, it's just 2020. It's just all of that. No, we've been in it for quite some time. It's canary in the coal mine feeling often. Uh, and the canary and is the size of Big Bird. Oh yeah, the canary <laughs> is a Muppet. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, what to wrap us up here? We're gonna try. We have about, I think, eight-ish minutes. If my clock is the same as everyone else's, sounds about um, right. All right. What is something that you would like to say in regards to our identities, um, folks out there listening? Uh, can be about mental health it can be about representation it can be about listen to us <laughs> you know um i'd love to hear something that everyone would love to kind of end up and at uh as your message out there to folks i mean for me it would be you know who you are is valid and it's something i've hugely struggled with for most of my life so it's just who you are is valid if you struggle with that it's you know, you are valid. Um, also, if anyone, you know, just again, I, I, I know I've yelled about it several times, but like, give us more representation, please. <laughs> just give us actual diverse representation, not slightly different spicy, um, would be great. That would be my two <laughs> takeaways. Um, I think I would say something along uh, similar lines, um, which is just that, uh, but I would take it a step further and encourage you, uh, anybody to learn more about yourself and your culture and your family, whether that means, uh, and maybe that maybe for reasons that are yours, that that doesn't mean talking to older generations in your family, right? But maybe it's reading, maybe it's as simple as reading literature, right? Translated literature, try and find a translator from the the author's country of origin right or maybe it's just doing some research about the history of colonialism in your fan in your culture's 
uh, country, right? And the ways in which that affected your culture. The more that you know, the more that you will understand intrinsically exactly what Val just said, which is that we are valid and our validity is not, um, does not hinge on anyone else's understanding or approval of it. Our validity as Latin Americans is going to be very, is going to look very different than even if our parents are Latin American, right? It's going to look different than the way that theirs looked. And it's certainly going to look different than our grandparents and, and older generations that lived and grew up in those countries, right? But, but it is still, we are still Latine people. We still have a connection to that. Um, and, and that can mean absolutely whatever you want it to. Um, but for me, the barrier for so long was I just didn't know. And I didn't know that it was worth knowing, right? Conceptually, maybe like, oh, I, there's some cool holidays that I'm going to learn about as a kid, right? But like, it didn't, I didn't know how important it would be for me as a human existing in the world, right? To know these things. So take a little time, go out there and do research and then hold whatever, as much or as little of it as matters to you close, right? If you go and you find all of this stuff and you're like, you know what? I don't identify with this. I don't connect to this. It isn't the way I was raised. My experiences in America, I'm using because I am an American Latin, right? Whatever. But like my experiences don't, don't connect to this in, in, that's okay too, right? Then you have that as part of your past and that is what it is. And you are who you are now, whatever that version is, but, but give yourself the gift of learning more if you can. Yeah, I think my takeaway in in that same vein very much is um, if you have a story or if you have a commentary or if you really want to talk about your experiences, um, not only are you valid and not only like do we want more, but also we want to hear from you. Um, I think that part of building a community and part of being in a community means not being so afraid to not say anything. Um, and I know there's a lot of fear right now of being saying something wrong or having lived an experience incorrectly or of having the in wrong perspective. Uh, but I think that being wrong means that we learn a lot more. Uh, and I think that it's astounding how much you feel like, oh, what I have to say isn't actually going to contribute, but it's your experience and it might contribute to somebody. Um, or your story that you have to tell might contribute to somebody and it might be even bigger once it leaves your hands uh, and reaches the viewer. So if you have a Latino story or if you want to talk about your lived experience, even if it's going to be different, even if it's going to be wild, just tell it, just say it uh, and, you know, become part of that community voice uh, as you move throughout the world. Yeah, I think I would echo a lot of what has already been said, like, in addition to you're valid, just I see you. Like, if you weren't seen, we wouldn't have Miles Morales. If you weren't seen, we wouldn't have Mirabel Madrigal. Mm -hmm. If you weren't seen, we wouldn't have In the Heights. We wouldn't have West Side Story. It had to start somewhere, right? So just be seen. I see you, you are there, you are valid. And if you are willing, scream it from the rooftops, tell the entire world your story because it's there, you're wanting to tell it and we all wanna see it. Love all of this. And I guess my little takeaway um, is thinking about what everyone before me just sh said is that another unfortunate thing, at least in my experience, that I feel like is big in our culture is shame. Please, and it takes so much to get there. I'm still trying to get there myself. Try not to let shame hold you back from embracing your culture at the same time. Whether it be shame of how your Spanish sounds Still keep trying, like, if that's uh, important to you, embrace it. Try not to let that shame or, you know, fear keep you from trying to embrace your culture and embrace everything that the fabulous folks here have said.
um, including mental health, right? There's a lot of shame around our mental health. Um, take care of yourself. Do what you need to do. Embrace <laughs> your identity and look for positive representation. Uh, we are done. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, um, for joining the panel. Uh, I'm really excited that I got to be a part of this. I believe everyone else is. Um, it was a blast. I don't know how long 30 seconds is. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs>